All right, if you'll take your Bibles, please open them to the book of Hebrews and the seventh chapter. And um, because God has a sense of humor, we're in verse 26 one more time. Hebrews chapter 7, join me in standing if you would, please. We're going to read verses 24 and following. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would give to us grace in this day, and we pray, God, that you would open the eyes of our heart and that you would cause us to see the glory of Christ. And God, cause us to understand that his work in our lives and that his power over our lives means that there are implications, there are commands, there are both opportunities and obligations for us to live our lives in a certain way. God, remind us that over every th single thing that you teach us in your word, there is always a point at which you command us, now go. Lord, let us live that out. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's a hidden implication in Hebrews 7.26. It is the so what of the truth that Jesus is the high priest who is fitting for us who is harmless, holy, undefiled, separate, the, the so what that he has become higher than the heavens. We've considered all of these things individually. We spent quite a bit of time on verse 26. But before we move on, we must consider that they paint a picture in concert, that they describe the most excellent of beings, and that his love and work for us is beyond all comprehension. And when we're granted a glimpse of this truth, we must ask the simple question, what then does this mean for me? What does this require of me? What is the therefore in these truths? So the first thing that we need to understand is that apart from God's intervention, we were outside of his love. The law could not provide hope for us. We had no hope in ourselves. And even Israel, if the priesthood was the answer, also had no hope. Ephesians 2.12 says, Remember that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, that was speaking to Gentiles. But the truth is, is that Israel could not be dependent upon the priests in order to fulfill the obligation of God because the priesthood itself was flawed. The law could not save, it was never intended to save, and the priests who were functioning and acting even in accordance to the law were only fulfilling partially what God required and what was necessary. The priests were absolutely unable to complete what was finally needed for forgiveness because what was finally needed for forgiveness was a real sacrifice that was actually powerful, that was actually pure, that was actually holy, that would be taken into the very presence of God and spread upon the mercy seat of heaven. What was needed was something that no human being could ever accomplish. What was absolutely needed was the work of God himself being made flesh, dying for sin, and offering his own blood upon the mercy seat as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. So whenever the priests slaughtered an animal, it pictured this. They would take the blood of the animal that was sacrificed, and they would sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. They would sprinkle it upon the altar. But those things could never take away sin, because the sacrifice itself was not enough, and those who offered it were not enough. And, and this is something we don't concentrate on enough, 
the altar and the temple and the, the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant and all of the things that were wrapped up in the Old Testament worship, none of them were actually sufficient. They were holding places. They were temporary. They were pictures of what went on in heaven. And so when Christ became our high priest and fulfilled the sacrifice, he did everything that was needful and not only here, but there as well. So what is the therefore of this truth? And, that, and I want to start here because it's something that we need to be mindful of. We spent all Bible study yesterday morning kind of talking around this. And it's this, never lose sight of your great need. Never lose sight of the fact that you needed rescuing. Never lose sight of the fact that God intervened in your life, that he met you in a place of brokenness and you were powerless. You had no hope, you had no strength, you had no ability to ever even take the slightest of steps towards him. And because of that, let your heart always be warmed towards Christ, who is the great answer. By remembering your need, you will remember what God has provided. By remembering your need, you will remember that Christ alone is the answer. And by remembering your need, you will remember that his love is something you did not deserve. And he deserves your all. So the fact that we could not be saved apart from this gives us this therefore. The second thing I want to point out to you is that God has provided in Christ everything needful. Now this is far larger than we ever can comprehend. This, this goes beyond the scope of anything we have ever thought about, talked about, addressed in any way. And it means that if God has provided everything that is needful in Christ, there is an obligation on our part to cast ourselves upon him. That, that he is the answer and that there is no other answer available. That all of our efforts to save ourselves, to, to add to the work of Christ, to do anything that we think will somehow make us more acceptable in the sight of God, to add to what Jesus has done, it's an affront to Christ. Because God has provided everything that is needful. God has provided all that is required. Sometimes I feel like we are like the petulant child who said to their parents, I want black Mercedes for my 16th birthday. And the parents buy them something that's not a black Mercedes, and they throw a hissy fit because I didn't get the thing that I wanted, in spite of the fact that what they provided was far better. And we'll throw ourselves in the ground and we'll rant and we'll rave and we'll tirade against God and we'll invent impossible situations so that we can somehow feel like we've added something to what God has already provided, knowing somewhere, knowing that what Christ did is always enough. The challenge for us as we think about the fact that God has provided is to remember that what he has provided is not only enough, it is bountiful. It surpasses everything that's necessary. It goes so far above and beyond, and it is an offense to God when we refuse to lay hold of Christ. It is an offense to God when we try to add to the working of Christ. It is an offense to God when we say, yeah, no, I'm not really interested. Now, that's an offense that God may overlook if he chooses to offer mercy and call someone to life. But don't ever lose sight of the fact that those who do not ever come to Christ stand also guilty of rejecting the one way that God has provided. It's not a small thing. And for us as followers of Christ, it's important that we recognize that God has called us to love him with our whole being because God has provided him. The fact of him being given obliges us to adore him. It obliges us to live our lives with him in our view always. It obliges us to live everything so that he himself is magnified. Now, this is because there is no other way that's going to work. And it's also because in Christ, it will always deliver. Make sense? Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord might be saved. No, that's not what it says, is it? 
It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, period. There's not a question mark attached. There's not a maybe if, there's not a as long as they do this, this, and this, as well as it is the simple, direct promise of God that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, period, end of discussion. God calls us to trust him, and he calls us to trust him exclusively. And Christ being given is a call for us to live that out. It's a call for us to embrace him as the thing we need above everything else. That, that it calls us to say, Lord, help me walk this out. Because in the end, this not only demonstrates God's love, but it shows us his incredible worth and the reason why we should praise. Because God demonstrates his own love towards us, Romans 5, 8 says, in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. While we still hated him, God loved us. While we still labored to do everything in our power to avoid him, he was doing everything needful to draw us to himself. And sometimes the things that were needful are not the things we would have chosen. Sometimes they are not the things that we would have said, yes, Lord, do it that way. Sometimes they're hard paths. Sometimes they're deep loss. Sometimes they're pain. Sometimes they're suffering. Sometimes it's, it's decades of addiction and decades of sorrow and decades of loss. Sometimes it's a lifetime of tears. But here's the truth. Whatever it takes to bring us to Christ is worth it. Whatever it takes to open our eyes to his working, it is worth it. Paul said, I have considered that the loss of all things is not worth being compared to the glory that's mine in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'll, I'll lay it all down. I will sacrifice every single thing in my life for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. He's that good. Now this is shown to us in the fact that he is what God has provided for our salvation. Amen? God, God didn't give us anything second rate. He didn't give us anything that wasn't going to complete. He, he didn't give us anything that wasn't going to satisfy. He didn't give us partials. He gave us everything. And not only did he give us everything, but he gave us the best of everything. So this gives us an important therefore to consider before we move on. And it is that we need, we are obligated to love and revere Christ and to love and revere God who gave him. That we are to recognize that even just the giving of Christ is such mercy and majesty and glory and power and beauty that God is worth being praised even if every other thing in your life you have ever asked him for is no. Do you understand that? Do you know that in your soul? Do you know that our, our refusal to praise God unless he does what we want is faithlessness? For just in giving Christ, God has already done far and away more than we could ever deserve. And just in giving Christ, he has already given far and away more than we can ever appreciate. So we need to be mindful of this. We need to discipline our souls to praise him for the fullness of all that he has done in Christ because he has provided for us. He has given to us everything that is needful. Everything. So scripture tells us that all of the promises of God in him are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. So Jesus Christ is everything that is needed for our sake. A hundred percent bar none. There is nothing required, nothing needful, nothing that is ever to be accomplished that Christ does not satisfy. He is our high priest. And remember, in the Old Testament, the role of the priest was to do what? It was to stand between God and man from the position of man. It was to say, Lord, please accept this on behalf of the people whom I represent. There were three offices in the Old Testament. There are three offices that Christ fulfills. 
There was prophet, there was priest, and there was king. The prophet spoke from God to the people. The priest interceded with God on behalf of the people. And the king stood as ruler over the people, operating on the, the command and authority of God. Christ is our priest, and he stands between us and God and carries everything needful into the presence of the Father, fulfilling what is required. There is no other. There is no other priest who is needed for your salvation. There is no other redeemer. There is no other mediator. There is no other intercessor. There is nobody else who is capable of standing between you and God. And there is nobody else who will. Because in order to stand between you and God, the priest must take upon himself your sin. He must take upon himself your sin and say, God, on behalf of those whom I represent, here is my life, here is my blood, here is my payment, and I offer it for their sake. There's nobody who can, and honestly, there's nobody who would. There is only Christ. There is only Jesus. There is only his blood. There is only his work. Any pretended priest, redeemer, mediator, or intercessor who says this person or me or this thing is a part of what Christ has done and they are in addition to Christ is a deceiver who seeks only to destroy the souls of men. And you need to understand that because there are many religions who put others in the place of Christ, who exalt others to the place where only Christ is. It is Jesus and Jesus Christ alone. Everything that is needful for your salvation has been accomplished in him. It's been accomplished in his work. And we have to be willing to abandon every other hope and cast ourselves fully upon Christ. So reason this out in your mind. Ask yourself this question. Do you somewhere in the darkness of your mind ask or believe that you are a Christian because of something you did? something you do, something you believe, something you contribute? Do you say to yourself, yeah, I believe in Jesus and that's really my hope, but I'm better than that person too. I don't do what Adam does. I, I don't do what Robert does. I, I don't do what Isabel does. I'm better. You see, that's a sickness that dwells in the hearts of most people. And if you're honest with yourself, there's probably a seed somewhere in you of that, that needs to be rooted out. It needs to be extracted because it is Christ and Christ alone who is our hope. It is Christ and Christ alone that we cast ourselves upon and it is His working and it is His will and it is His power and it is His sovereign choice and it is His mercy and it is His death and it is His blood and it is Him and Him and Him and Him alone. And as followers of Christ, this needs to be the resounding theme of everything that we cling to. It is Christ alone and nothing else. Nothing in me, nothing in you, nothing in the church, nothing in our obedience, nothing in our choosing, nothing in our willing, nothing in anything. It is Jesus Christ alone. And we would not even have the capacity to choose him had God not first chosen us had God not first opened our hearts. And any pretense to the contrary is an offense to God, is an offense to Christ. He calls us to honor him above everything else because he will not share his glory with another. God tells us that over and over again in the scripture. He tells us, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another nor my praise to carved images. Whether we carve them with our hands or carve them with our minds, it's all the same thing. He gives his prerogatives to no one. He shares his duties with no one. There is no such thing as, as God saying, well, I'm going to delegate this part of salvation to this person. I'm going to delegate this authority to, to this person so that they can then participate in the salvation that I've worked. 
God doesn't bend the knee to anyone. He doesn't yield to anyone. He doesn't delegate. He doesn't share. Jesus Christ is the only one who stands between. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. And all of these prerogatives and all of these responsibilities and all of these roles and all of this working and all of this glory, it belongs to Christ and to Christ alone. It belongs to God in the fullness of who he is. And it is his power to do. Everything that we need, God has provided. Just think about that for a minute. What is your need? Move that question beyond even the issue of salvation because it applies to all of life. What is your need? What is it that you need in order to function? What is it that you need in order to get, to provide your life? Everything is God's. Everything that he has, everything that he gives. Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21 says this. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What do you need? What are you asking God for? What are you trusting him in order to produce in your life? What do you need from him in order to sort out whatever it is that you're wrestling with? Are you looking to him and to something else? Are you expecting your power, your work, your labor, your effort, your wisdom, your supply, your resource? Are you expecting anything to give to you what you need? Now, this is not to say that God won't use means, because he does. But if we're looking to those things, we're not looking to God. We have to trust him first and fully. We have to lean in to his glory. We have to recognize the truth that all that comes to us comes to us from God, and that he is the single thing that we need above every other thing. And that if we have him, we have all that we need. That if we have his favor, we have all that is necessary. God calls us to lean into him, to trust him, to cast ourselves upon him, because he has provided this high priest who is holy, who is harmless, who is undefiled, who is separate from sinners, who has been exalted above the heavens. He has provided all of these things in Christ. Do you think that he's not going to be able to come up with a loaf of bread? I mean, really? How ridiculous is it that we would actually pretend like we can trust God with our souls, but we can't trust him with our finances? How foolish is it to believe that we could trust God with eternity, but we can't trust him with our time? You see, God calls us to trust him with everything and to recognize that whatever you're looking at in your life and saying, I have a lack here, I need this, I have to provide this, I have to sort this out, I, I need this help, I need this strength, and so I'm going to go someplace else to find it because, well, that's not really God to do. That's faithlessness, because he has provided everything that is needful in Christ, period. Jesus Christ is the answer to all of life's questions. He is the answer to all of life's problems. He is the answer to all of your needs, and he is the supply that Christ gave. And he is able to abundantly and exceedingly above everything that you ask or think. Think about that. How big is your imagination? How large is your dream? How much do you need? How much do you want? How much do you pray for? God is able to give above and beyond exceedingly abundantly more than you could ever ask or imagine. We talk about your wildest imaginations. God surpasses them. And God surpasses them exponentially. Far and away above. Far and away beyond what you could ever possibly comprehend. You have no need that is not answered in Christ Jesus. Period. Do you believe that? 
You might believe it in theory, but do you believe it where the rubber meets the road? Do you believe it in life? Do you believe it when you walk out those doors and something happens? Do you recognize that your first supply is Christ? Or do you think, ah, well, that, that's, that's good Sunday talk, preacher, but it's not going to help me on Monday morning when this broke and that's happening and this thing went wrong and that thing went south. Is Christ enough? Is Christ enough to provide all that we need? All that we desire? All that we require? Is Christ enough? Do we believe that Christ is enough? Do we live as if we believe that Christ is enough? Because I, I know the truth of my own life. I know that I don't get this right. See, God calls us to lean into this. He calls us to look unto Christ for everything. To believe that He is actually the supply of God for all of our life need. No matter what. He is what God has given. And more than that, He is what God continues to give. He is our need. Beyond that, he is also God's wisdom on display. We see the majesty of God displayed in Christ. Jesus told the disciples when they said, show us the Father, it's enough. Jesus said, you still don't know who I am, do you? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So the wisdom of God, the glory of God, the, the strength of God, the power of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, the hatred of God towards sin, the justice of God in executing his wrath upon those who refuse to repent, all of this is shown in the face of Jesus. All of this is shown in the power and the glory of who he is. Here's how Peter put it in 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So Peter says, when we saw Jesus, we saw the majesty of God. We saw the glory of who God is. We often try to put an artificial distinction between God and Jesus. But they are two of the three persons of the Godhead. They are fully God. They are co-equal. They have different roles and different functions, but they are the same God. We worship a triune God who manifests himself in three persons, but is one God. We're not modalists. We don't believe that he is at one moment God and at another moment Jesus and at another moment the Holy Spirit. That's heresy. Neither are we tritheistic. We don't believe there are three gods. We are Trinitarian. We believe that there is one God who presents himself in three persons. Now, ask me to explain it further than that, and I'm going to go, uh -huh. I can give you man's best opinions. I can give you man's best imaginings, but this is mystery. And mystery is okay, because a God that you can fully explain is no God. By definition, if you can completely comprehend and understand it, you made it up. <laughs> it's in your brain. It's less than you are. See, a God that you can fully explain is a God of your imagination. There's room for mystery. And, and that's part of the reason why God presents himself the way that he does, so that we recognize he's more than we are. He calls us to lean in. He calls us to recognize that in seeing Jesus, we see something beyond just this man. 
And if we rightly understand that truth, it leads us to worship. So when you ponder Hebrews 7.26, as I hope you have been since we've been camped on it for a month and a half, <laughs> as you ponder Hebrews 7.26 and you think about Christ being holy and harmless and undefiled and separate from sinners and exalted above the heavens, if you think about the fact that he is fitting for us, which is where we started, so that's six sermons just on this one passage. As you contemplate this, I hope that what you ponder, at least in part, is this awareness that this is far bigger than I can comprehend. There is so much more that I cannot get my head around, so much more than I cannot understand. I hope that what it causes you to do is to say, Lord, give me a sight of you that elevates my thinking. Let me see more of you. I praise you, God, that when you open my eyes and you open my understanding, my heart also opens in worship because you deserve to be worshipped for who you are. See, one of the things that we struggle with is, is a relationship with God that is not strictly focused on our need. So let me unpack that statement just a little bit. When you pray, do you follow the pattern of the model prayer? How does Jesus say we are to pray? He begins with worship for God because of his person and nature. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's a model for us. It is an example of what prayer looks like. And Jesus begins at worship in its purest and rawest form. It is the beholding of God and saying, God, you are awesome beyond my comprehension. When you pray, do you worship God for who he is? Or do you run right to gimme, gimme, gimme? Which is a part of prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. These are all gimme's. But do you run right to the gimme's? Or do you pause to contemplate God? Do you worship him in truth and beauty? Do you see him for who he is, for what he's revealed to you? Do you say, Lord, I, I love you because you're harmless to me? Because you could have destroyed me, but you chose instead to save me. Because your mercy is surpassing. Do you worship him in the beauty of holiness? Do you lay your heart out before him and say, God, I adore you for who you are? I hope as you contemplate Hebrews 7.26, it gives you some food for thought to worship him in, in the beauty of who he is. To recognize the heart and the character and the nature of our God who calls us into a relationship in spite of the fact that there is nothing in us that deserves it and nothing in us that would recommend us to him ever. Not now, not future. God didn't look on the future us and go, oh, I know Adam's going to choose me, therefore I choose Adam. Who does that give the credit to? Adam. Not that I'm not a fan of Adam, but I don't think he's all that. God chose us because he chose us. And we worship him because he is who he is. And it is the right order of things. And we so often get the cart before the horse. And we so often put our prayer life completely upside down. And here's the sad thing about it. When we put it upside down and we run to the gimme's first, we never get to anything else. We never get past it. Because our, our list of needs is abundant. And it grows in the telling, right? I mean, how many times have you recognized this? You're praying for somebody, you're praying for something, you're praying for a need, and while you're praying, you're thinking, oh, and I need this, and I need that, and this has to happen, and that has to happen. And we try to solve the problem instead of just laying it before God. See, God calls us to worship him. He calls us to love him. And we get to see the majesty of God in Christ, and it should cause us to worship. 
It should cause us to fall on our face before him and say, God, you are worthy. I adore you. I love you. I magnify your name. I, I cannot be believed that you have actually permitted me to see you like this. I cannot comprehend why. And truthfully, I am more stupid than any man because I cannot even comprehend what I'm seeing. And yet you still open my eyes. I love you. Thank you for letting me behold you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your glory. Thank you for your majesty. Thank you, God. This is what it means to us when we recognize that Christ displays the Father. Because if we've seen Christ, we've seen the Father. And that's honestly part of our dilemma. God is high and holy and far off and hard for us to comprehend. We see him displayed in Scripture to some degree. But the person of Christ opens our eyes to the majesty and the glory and the beauty of God in ways that we would never have had Christ not come. Even setting aside his work in salvation, just in the display of the Father, Christ has done so much for us. Not that I want to set aside salvation. Please don't mishear me. See, God calls us to worship. And he calls us to worship because of him. Because of his majesty. Because of his glory. Because he is the one who is displayed in Christ. This is why Jesus told the woman at the well, the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. This is why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Because everything that he does, he does for all the right reasons. And he always does what is needful. Right? Jesus does what is required. So here's your biblical geography lesson. Galilee is in the far north of Israel. Jerusalem is in the south. Between Galilee and Jerusalem is the land of Samaria. And most Jews did not like the Samaritans, did not want to go through Samaria, so that there was a very good road that went around Samaria, so that a good Jew who was traveling from Jerusalem to the northern regions didn't have to go through Samaria. But the scripture tells us that Jesus, going from the north to the south, in John chapter 4, verse 4, needed to go through Samaria. Now just think about that for a minute. What could possibly have motivated him to need to go through Samaria? Well, I gave you a hint just a minute ago. There was a well, and there was a woman, and there was an appointment, a divine appointment, which showed the light of Christ to a woman desperately in need of salvation. See, Jesus always does what is needful, even when it doesn't make sense to anybody else. And even when it might be an inconvenience, and even when it might cause people to question and wonder, even when it's not something that we would normally do, he always does what is needed. For us as followers of Christ, this is something for us to latch on to. Our, our high priest, who did what was needful to save us, is always still at work doing what is needful to save others. And he is always still at work doing what is needful to teach us and to grow us and to cause us to be conformed to his image. He is doing what is needed. And this should cause us to say, Lord, help me worship, help me understand, help me do what is right, because I don't really know quite what you're doing, and honestly, I'm a little afraid. Right? 
I see these needs, I see these requirements, I see these things, and these are all I can see, but they're not really what's needed. Because all of our need is answered where? In Him, in Jesus, right? This is what was in the mind of Christ. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Starting at verse 25. Jesus said this, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not of more value than you? I'm sorry, are you not of more value than they? That makes a little more sense, sorry. Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. We, we get things sideways because we think we know what we need. God knows what we need, and he is always faithful to provide what we need. Now, as I said earlier, it's not always what we want, but it's always what we need. It's not always what we would choose, but it's always what we need. And Jesus gives us a priority to establish in our life. And he says this, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek after his righteousness. Let that be the thing that defines your life. And all the rest of these things, God will add. All the rest of these things, God will take care of because they are his responsibility. Now, here's the way this works in practice. You faithfully fulfill the obligations that are put in front of you. You do your jobs, you fulfill your obligations, you, you, you work, you, you feed your family, you do all those things, but you do not let them be the priority that drives you away from God. You set his things first in your heart, first in your mind, and you recognize that in doing what you can do, you're going to fall down, you're going to fail, you're going to miss the mark. And you let God deal with all the rest of it because he will provide and fill in the gaps and do everything that is needful so long as your mind and heart are set first on him. We get sideways to this because we think that the doing of the doing is our job. But it's really not. The doing of the doing is just the method. The job is to concentrate on him. The job is to seek after him to grow in grace, to be mindful of the kingdom, to let his work and his word be the priority of your life, and to trust him to take care of everything else. Because be honest with yourself. Even if you hit it on all cylinders all the time, would you ever get it all done? Not a chance. Because as soon as you finish one thing, there's 12 more ready to take its head. It's like a hydra. It's always there, ready to grow a new one and, and make it worse. But God, he not only finishes, he finishes well. And he fulfills everything that is needful and fulfills everything that is required. And it is because of who he is. It is because of his nature. It is because of his person. It is because of his own being that he can be trusted to do all of these things. 
Therefore, here's your therefore. Always let your love for Christ be the thing that defines and motivates you. And let your love for Christ aim you towards God. Because God is one and he's not to be separated. We're not called to pit one person of the Trinity off against another. So let your love for Christ naturally aim you towards God. Let your love for God naturally magnify Christ. Let the Spirit lift all of these things up and allow these things to fashion in you such a love for Christ that not only is seeking first the kingdom that which you are called to do, but let it also be that which you desire to do. Because you can't seek the kingdom first if you're just doing it out of an obligation. It has to be the love of your life. It has to be your desire. It has to be the thing that you want above everything else. And beloved, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to fall down, and you're going to, you're going to find yourself wrapped up in worry. Or you're going to find yourself getting your priorities outside. When that happens, repent. Turn back to him. Realign yourself. Spend some time contemplating Hebrews 7.26 that he is holy, that he is fitting, that he is harmless, that he is undefiled, that he is higher than the heavens. Separate from sinners. He is all of these things. Spend some time just thinking about the glory of who Christ is and what it has been in revealing it to you. Let that re-aim you. Let that realign you. Let that lift high your heart so that you love as you're called to love. And then recognize that if we truly love, there is a responsibility for us to walk out the holiness of God that has been demonstrated to us and planted in us as followers of Christ. Now, here's where I'm about to stop preaching and start meddling, and that's okay. There is no room in the life of a Christian for known sin. Do you hear me? There is absolutely zero tolerance if you are a follower of Christ for known sin. When you harbor sin and you harbor evil in your life, you are robbing God of his just desert of worship and obedience. And you do not expect his blessing when you are harboring sin because sin is the enemy of God. So God calls us to the best of our ability and with the fullness of our mind to walk out holiness in obedience to his command. Now, does this mean you're always going to get this right? Nope, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying, though, is that you are not permitted to have a little closet in your heart where you say, hey, 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 my precious. Right? We're not called to be Gollum here. We're called to hate sin and to cast it away from us. Do you understand? God says we are to walk in holiness. He brings us... Okay. If what he did entered into the very presence of God, he, he died... He carried his blood as sacrifice to the very altar of heaven, to the very throne of God, to the mercy seat itself, the actual mercy seat, not the top of the Ark of the Covenant that men made as a pattern after that which was shown Moses in the heavens, but the actual mercy seat of God where God sits enthroned between the cherubim. And he carried his own blood to the throne of God and he cast it upon the feet of God and said, here is my sacrifice and these are my people. And Christ carried you into the presence of God with him and carries you into the presence of God with him still. Is there any place for your sin in that picture aside from being cast away? How dare we say, yes, God, I want your salvation, but I kind of enjoy this thing. I want to keep doing it, if you don't mind. God says, no, I mind. <laughs> I mind quite a bit. And if you keep it up, we're going to have a tussle. 
Yeah, you're going to lose. Right? Because God is determined that his people walk in holiness. God calls us to cast away known sin. He calls us to walk in obedience. He calls us to love him more and obey him more because Christ has not, verse nine of, or ch- verse 24 of chapter 9 in Hebrew says this, Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Do you recognize how dangerous it is to be careless about God? Do you recognize how dangerous it is to be careless about sin? Do you recognize how dangerous it is to be flippant with the blood of Christ? See, God calls us to be earnest about these things. It's absolute idiocy to be in casual in regards to the working of God in your life, especially where your salvation is concerned. This is the most blood-earnest thing you will ever engage in, is following after Christ. It is more important than anything else you will ever do. It is the single thing that defines all things. And God calls us to follow him with earnestness. When you read about God delivering Israel out of the hand of Egypt, out of the power of the Pharaoh, and out of all the things that happened, it's it's an amazing story. If you haven't read Exodus in in a while, I recommend you just go back and read it. It's, It's a remarkable story. But you know what's most astounding about the book of Exodus to me? It's how often the people of God saw the hand of God and then went, eh, whatever. We had leeks and onions in Egypt. Let's go back. What? No. Turn to me to Hebrew, or not Hebrews, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Let's do, let's do what's actually going to help. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to give you a perspective on that issue, and maybe it will help define what I'm trying to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and we're going to start reading at verse 6. Actually, let's read verse 5. We'll start with a T. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. The the literal language there is they littered the wilderness with their corpses. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after the evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them were also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who stands take heed lest he fall. For no temptation has overcome you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape so that you may be able to bear it. How many times do you live your life thinking to yourself, well, I I, I did that and I just can't not do that. And I recognize that in the moment that sometimes feels completely true. I'm not defending it, I'm not condoning it, but I am saying that God calls us to engage with it as if it's actually a problem. And that's really the issue here. It's not that you sin, and it's not that you keep sinning, it's that you don't care that you keep sinning. And that's never acceptable to God. God says you should care about it, and you should fight against it as if it is your worst enemy. 
And, and he's so concerned about it and so earnest about it that he literally decimated an entire generation of Israel, according to what Paul said, for our teaching. What? He destroyed an entire generation of his chosen people so that he would teach us? What do we matter? Well, here's why we matter. Because upon us is the fulfillment of the working of God through all the generations. For we are partakers of Christ. They weren't. They were heirs of the covenant. They were the children of promise. They were the descent of Abraham. But they were not partakers of Christ. You are closer to God than they were. And God did all that he did in their lives to teach you. Do you not think that he cares that you get the lesson? Amen? He calls us to imitate him. Not to imitate the world in which we live, not to live like the world, not to fall down like the lost, but to imitate Christ. He calls us to walk in obedience to the command of his glory. Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 17. It says this, I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened because of being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on Christ, put on the new man which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. You see, God makes a way for us to walk in his truth. Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7 says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Therefore, here's your therefore, let your life abound in the imitation of Christ in every way, without exception. We are to be imitators of Christ. So as you ponder and think on Hebrews 7.26, think about what it means for your life that you should put on these same things and walk in imitation of who Christ is. And one last thing quickly this morning. It means that we are who we are because of him. The church is magnificence embodied. Do you ever think about that? That the church of God is the magnificence of Christ embodied among the nations? That this thing, this imperfect group of people, that the preacher just got done meddling and you know all that kind of stuff, we are the actual embodiment of the glory of Christ among the nations. That's your job as the church. That never stops. It never grows old. It never comes to an end. We are who we are because of his work. We are his body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, you are the body of Christ. You are members of it individually. We are a part of the bride. We are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So here's my last therefore for you. We need to care about the church, and we need to bring the church honor and glory by how we live and how we speak and what we do. We need to give to the church of God the priority that it deserves because it is the manifest glory of God among the nations. This thing matters. Right? And in this generation, that's not news that people want to hear. In this generation, church has become something that you simply go to when it's convenient. If there's nothing else going on, 
as long as you're not tired or busy or got ball practice or got this games on TV or that show that I really want to see or this activity or that. It's a, it's a add on of convenience. But what the scripture affirms is that this thing that we do collectively, whenever we do it, matters. It's important. And if you can be here, you should be here, period. It's, it's what we're called to do together as the people of God. Because this thing doesn't make sense to the world. This is not just a club. And this is certainly not a I'm better than you club. This is a place where we call one another to walk in righteousness, to fulfill the thing which has been set before us to do. This is a place where the glory of Christ shines in the eyes of the lost, where they behold us loving one another and living in a way that magnifies him, where they see us actually caring for each other, and more than that, actually caring about the truth of God. It speaks to the world when you guys walk into this building with your Bibles in your hand. Amen? It tells them there's something that binds us together. There's something that these people are revering. There's something that these people are listening to. It speaks to the world when you gather together and study his word. It speaks to the world when your lives are filled with love for one another so that you actually desire the communion of fellowship with the body of Christ. So that you say, you know what? I haven't seen them in a couple of days. I hope we have church tonight. I love those people. When you start to live that out, when it starts to be the thing that defines your life, when you start to look at your calendar and your obligations and your schedule and you say, no, I can't do that because we've got church. And it matters. I'm not saying this just because when you're not around, I'm lonely. <laughs> I am, but that's not the point. <laughs> I'm saying this because this is a blessing that God has made for you. And in case you missed the implication of being the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ is the church, not the individuals. There is no one of us who is the bride. But collectively, we are. We are called to honor Christ by loving his bride. And there is a therefore in there that we all could be better at. To care for one another, to engage in those relationships, to be mindful of the opportunities, to do the things that are possible for us to do, and to challenge ourselves to do more. And it's not just for those of you who are here who are the faithful, but it's for all of us. Beloved, if you know somebody who belongs here and isn't here, go find out why. Go see what's going on. When people are missing, we're not whole. Make sense? If I got up out of bed tomorrow and my left leg decided to stay in bed, that'd be an odd day. I, I wouldn't function as well as I would hope to function. Amen? God calls us to honor the body because Christ is all that he is that's described in Hebrews 7.26. He is all of that for the body. It matters to him. Should it not matter to us? Should it not be something that's on our radar to be constantly asking, Lord, how can I love this better? How can I do this better? What are you calling me to, to engage in? What are you calling me to put aside so that I can engage in it? What is it that you want me to do so that I can bring honor and glory to you through how I interact with the body. Because the church 
whether it's generationally appropriate to say this or not, the church is God's one plan for the gospel invading the world and advancing the kingdom. There is no plan B. Do you understand that simple truth? There's no plan B. There's no other option. It is the church being the church. And he spreads the gospel over the face of the whole earth through the power of the church. Being faithful with the gospel. Let's pray. God, I ask that you give to us grace in this day. And I pray, Lord, that you would make us mindful of all of these things, God, and help us whenever we approach your word to look at the question, what does this mean? Why do I need to engage with this? What is this there for? God, I pray that over our hearts and over our lives and over our minds, you would make us faithful to you. Remind us of your grace and of your glory and teach us to love and honor Jesus, who is everything to us. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray.